Good morning, everybody. My name is, uh, thanks for joining us. My name is Chris Angelo, and I'll start here on Wednesday. I just want to go ahead and open up the meetings. And we'll get started with the policy uh, if you look a little bit after. Good morning, everyone. My name is Chris Kinsler. Uh, we're just going to wait a couple more minutes for any additional folks to come on. And uh, we'll uh, begin your time. Good morning, everyone. Good
Right. Well, good morning, everyone. My name is Chris Kinkler, and welcome to the Central Recreation Public Media Webinar. I'm a land resource specialist with the Bureau of Land Resources at the St. Charles River Water Management System. We have a great program today this morning, and uh, we look forward to presenting you some really great information from our land management system recreation. Joining us today will be Art Davis, Pete Hands, Graham Williams, Maria Donovan, as well as other Bureau staff. To help us see the comments and questions we have. Now let's go through the agenda, what we have planned. So, we're going through the introduction right now. Um, just to familiarize the group meeting, uh, our goals, properties that we'll be covering, as well as uh, a look for polls. And our land managers have included their uh, annual review of what they've done and, and they'll be presenting those. I'll be back with the uh, recreation rules evaluation presentation. Again, our uh, Southern Program Manager to introduce the public comment panel and then I'll do that for that. So make sure you can expand your, um, your panel by uh, on the air key on top, don't want the air key at the top. And you should be able to see a chat function. Sometimes you also have questions. Um, any questions that will, will be asked of, of district staff must be in writing, either through the chat or through the question ball. Uh, also, um, feel free to email central recreation comment at sjrwmd.com. I'll do that for a moment. And and I'll be monitoring that email account as well as the chat and, and the question uh, boxes for us. Uh, there's not going to be local questions, uh, so as as all all questions need to be typed out, so they can be entered as well. This meeting is being recorded, and uh, we'll keep the broadcast as long as we Our purpose today is for the district to receive public comment regarding recreation utilization of our land. So this is we're here for y'all. Um, please utilize those functions in the um, chat of questions as well as the email. The properties that we'll be covering today are pretty wide from Putnam, Clyde counties, throughout Volusia County, the Marion, Lake. Brevard, Orange, Seminole County. So, and you see the, the associated land managers with the property. And it's a lot of really good information for you to put through. So, with that, we'll do a couple of polls. We'll bring those up. Um, first, to and, uh, how many recognition public meetings? Have you been to? And then we'll go through Most of y'all have your first one. Welcome. What's your favorite activity on this week? There's a call in Muskell. We're going to join Hartley and Fisher. Yes. How often do you do that? Like?
Donc, il y a tout ça. Du coup, ça se tente. Et le last one. As far as these RPMs, is, is this time what's the best? There's a better time for this. All right, looks like this time works for real well for everybody. So we'll have to finish that. So from there, we're going to go into our, our presentation. And uh, Maria Zonaga is the first one. Hello everyone, I'm Maria Zondervan. I'm going to be speaking to you today about the Southwest region. So within the Southwest region, um, we have two properties. That's the Lake Harris Conservation Area and the Lake Apopka Conservation Area. Other than hydrilla treatments and property security, there's not much happening at Lake Harris. So I'll be concentrating primarily on the Lake Apopka North Shore. So in the fire category, we have had two prescribed burns for a total of 3,337 acres. Um, excited to announce that we had our first burn ever on the Marsh Flowway, and that went really well. And we've assisted with numerous prescribed fires in other regions, and we've had no wildfires this year. The blue outline here just shows uh, where those uh, burns took place. So it was the Duda parcel sort of smack in the middle of the property there. And then over on the west end, that is the marsh flowway. So here's a look at the marsh flowway before it was burned. You can see the types of vegetation that were in there. Here we're going to take a look around the burn um, as it was while we were flying in the helicopter and uh, doing this burn. So you can see it's a rather mosaic burn. There are some wetter patches that don't burn very well. Different vegetation burns differently. So it's not going to be, you know, 100% complete burn, but it's low intense fire, which is what we like to see out here. So um, um, keeping that intensity low is really important in order not to burn up the organic soils out there. But uh, some of the drier areas were more complete and uh, others, like I said, a little more sparse. So that is the marsh flowway burn. And we'll take a look back at our smoke column here in a minute. You can see we put up a bit of a, of a smoke signal there for folks. So this is kind of a look at the burn uh, after the fact. And again, you can see that uh, there are areas that burned and areas that didn't burn. So a nice mosaic. Getting on to the law enforcement category, we've got the standard issues as always. We've got trespassing. Um, in this case, you could see on this photo that it wasn't enough to have a chain link fence. We had to extend that chain link fence all the way into the water. And even then they were trying to part the gate from the rest of the fence to where we had to put some chains in there. So that's a shame. Um, dumping is a constant problem. Um, Feeding alligators has become an issue out there. We've got law enforcement patrolling more on the weekends to keep that from happening more. Abandoned animals continues. Here's the whole list of all the various species of animals that we've had um, dumped on the property so far. Uh, we just added a green iguana to that list. Uh, we managed to catch that and turn it over to Fish and Wildlife Commission. Poaching unfortunately continues. So there's a picture of a poached gator down there fishing on the property, even though those, say, those fish have not been tested to assure they are safe for human consumptions, and we have signs to that effect, um, it continues. And then we also had cattle trespassing this year, and that's, that's a first. So here we are actually helping the Lake County Sheriff's Department with a cattle roundup. Uh, they actually brought out a cowboy and a dog and the whole bit. So this was a first for us. Um, hog control on Lake Apopka North Shore is done by the USDA through their Wildlife Services Division. So we've had an agreement with them for years. And uh, for this reporting period, they've removed 48 hogs since December 2020. 
and that is a significant uh, reduction in damage out there. We're just not seeing as much rooting as we had before, so they're doing a, a bang up job. One of the fun things about having cameras on the property is that you get a lot of uh, animals that uh, photobomb you. So um, bears love to do it. We've got bobcats out there, coyotes. Here's some more coyotes looking at one of the traps for the hogs. Uh, turkeys, wild turkeys. We're so excited to see them because for a long time we didn't have any wild turkeys on Lake Popka North Shore. Here's an otter. I do believe this is the first time we caught an otter on the camera. And uh, here's some juvenile bears just playing, having a good time out there, having a little wrestling match. And uh, this is a great fun series. Um, so these are barrels of corn that we use for baiting the hogs and here this bear has caught the scent of that corn and really wants some so he's actually going for it in those barrels goes all the way into the barrels next picture he's disappeared so we're assuming he's inside the barrel and then reappears from behind the barrel so just just a, a fun thing to share with you there Construction and maintenance. So we are really busy building and maintaining things out here at Lake Apopka North Shore. So the Wildlife Drive was resurfaced again, and it is now on a regular maintenance schedule. So that happens regularly. The Phase 4 pump station is now complete. We'll talk a little bit more about that. The marsh flowway got rehabbed. Um, so after a while, short circuiting starts to happen there. We'll talk a, a little more about that in a minute. But um, so it had to be uh, completely rehabbed. So that's sort of a first out there. Got that done. Uh, the Duda project is also complete. We'll talk about that a bit more in a minute. And uh, stabilized the pump house basin pond and did some levee repairs. There's also an interconnect project nearing completion. Got maybe another month or so to go on that. A new picnic pavilion was put in. Some new osprey platforms, raptor perches, uh, interceptor bridge was repaired, pump house boardwalk was renovated, and two towers were repaired. Take a little closer look here. So this is staff putting together some picnic tables that uh, were then placed out on the property. And this is with donation dollars. Uh, so here we are moving a kiosk to make room for that and uh, moving a fence as well and just building it all and you can see it was COVID time Cindy there's wearing a mask had to put in a little parking area so people could park at that new uh, picnic area and there it is once it's um, all kind of built that's before the tables went in but you can see the parking area there the pavilion in place fence out of the way and uh, that structure there. And there it is with the tables. And again, you can see the sign here, your donations that work. So this was all people donating um, money to the wildlife drive as they're out visiting it and that money coming back to the property. So there's just kind of another look at it. And then uh, you can see out here in the distance, there are some poles here. So these are not telephone poles with wires on them like all over the rest of the place. This was also part of improvements out on the site. So we thought it would be nice if you're sitting at these picnic tables to be able to see some of our, our birds up close. So staff, once again, um, we're busy building. So here they are building an osprey fl nesting platform. And um, that then went up on this pole. And if you thought it might be easy to stick a pole in the ground, it's not. We had to get a big giant auger to make a giant hole for this thing and then some heavy equipment to raise that up. So we did that not only with the Osprey platform, but also with several uh, perching poles for raptors. So here's some Osprey showing off how well all those structures working, but we've seen uh, bald eagles out there and peregrine falcons and all sorts of uh, hawks and even anhingas using this stuff. So. Uh, very successful project. Other construction, this is by the pump house. So the old um, walkway, boardwalk, whatever you call it, uh, that goes between the pump house and the lake itself was in pretty rough shape. Uh, the surface was rather uneven. Some cyclists were having some trouble there. Um, it may also have been getting more and more difficult for wheelchairs. So we decided to pour concrete there instead. And while we're at it, also replace the wooden a railing with some nice aluminum railing. So got a nice new fresh look, should hold up for a real long time. Our towers, so this is the lakeside 
uh, tower on your left and the marsh flow tower on the right and both of them have been renovated they had a lot of a um, lot of issues that have now been brought up and they look fantastic here's some look at a levy repair some levy repair work happening as well as the stabilization that happened around the pump house this is the interconnect project that we mentioned in the big picture there uh, so that's nearing completion so that's going to connect allow us to move water between phases that we weren't able to move water before and then the bottom picture there is that bridge repair we were talking about this is the phase four pump station so this one is fully complete again this is to allow for water movements between phases um, and and what that does what, what makes it so important is the more we can move water around the property the less we have to discharge water to the lake and anytime we discharge water to the lake we could be adding to the phosphorus load of the lake so we try to minimize that so we're going to talk a little bit about the marsh flowway this is a depiction of the marsh flowway so what happens is water comes in from the lake at the bottom of your picture there and then it flows through the cells and you see the it kind of shows green water coming in and blue water coming out that's where the idea is that the water filters through these marsh systems um, in a natural way so by the water moving slowly through there the suspended solids start to drop down out of the water column and uh, phosphorus is absorbed by the plants so by the time it reaches the end of the cells all of that water is cleaner but what can happen is after a while with water moving through there the water you know naturally finds the 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 path of least resistance right and it starts cutting cutting a valley so to speak cutting cutting a path we call that short circuiting so that's what had been happening out here and so the marsh flowway was running less efficient than it had been so that is why they went through and um and did the region uh renovations to it that they did so Here's a look at the marsh flow wave uh, before all of that took place. The lake is towards the bottom of the pitcher, and it's the little pump basin that you see that triangular kind of area with with the uh, the pumps right here. OK, the lakes over on this side. Um, so this is what it looked like before. And when we look a little closer, you can see some of that short circuiting that's happening. You can see there's just paths that the water is cutting through here. And so what happens then is that the water starts moving too fast through here and it doesn't get as clean as we want it to be. So this is sort of um, part way through, or actually this is after it's been complete and the reflooding is starting and vegetation starting to come back up. Uh, but we'll take a look at some of the pictures of, of them actually doing the construction. So it looks almost like it's back in the farming days, you know, lots of exposed soil and they're just smoothing all that soil out, making it all level uh, once again. So there you see, it kind of looks like big open farm fields for a while while they're out there doing that work. But it's amazing how fast that vegetation came back afterwards. And there's uh, an aerial taken with our drone footage that kind of shows all that in progress there. And there it is complete. You can see there's no more short circuits. Everything is nice and even and the vegetation's coming back. As you probably know, our whole purpose for being here at Lake Apopka North Shore is to clean up the water of the Lake Popka itself. So I want to talk a little bit about the phosphorus reduction approach that we use to get at the goals of uh, improving the water quality in Lake Apopka. So there's this whole diet exercise approach to that. So just as you're trying to shed a couple pounds, it matters what you put in, right? And it also matters what you do to get off the pounds you already have. So we're going to take that same approach to phosphorus. So by reducing the volume of water pumped from the North Shore to the lake by having all these pumps internally and levees and um, structures that we can open and move water around on the North Shore, we're putting less phosphorus into the lake itself. We're just moving it around on the North Shore and letting the plants kind of take it up there. 
But when we do have to discharge water into the lake, we also have the ability now to inactivate that phosphorus by treating it with aluminum sulfate. So you may have seen some tanks out there with this liquid alum in it, as we call it. And that is used to make sure that when we do pump water from the North Shore into the lake, that it does not contain as much phosphorus. And then the other big part of the diet was the passing the Popka stormwater rule. So that's where the exercise part. Then we have the, I mean, I'm sorry, the diet part. Then we have the exercise part, which is removing the phosphorus that's already in the lake. So there are two main approaches to that. There's um, the harvest of rough fish known as gizzard shad to remove the phosphorus that um, those fish have within their bodies. Um, they also, the way they feed, they feed on the bottom it stirs up a lot of phosphorus and they're consuming plants that have a lot of phosphorus that would not otherwise be available in the water column of the lake. When those um, fish do that, they stir it up into the water column as well as by them consuming it and then defecating in the water column, it releases that phosphorus. And then when the fish die, they decompose and that releases phosphorus as well. So by fishing and actually removing those fish from the lake, we remove the phosphorus that they contribute. So that's part of the exercise program. And then that marsh flowway that we keep talking about, that is a big part of that exercise program by running the water physically through there so that the marshes within that flowway can filter out that phosphorus and remove some of the suspended solids as well. And it's working really well. Here you see a picture of what the Lake Apopka North Shore used to look like. This was back in the farming days. And it all changed starting in 1996 when the Lake Apopka Restoration Act was passed. And that basically directed the district to buy the North Shore farms. And this was to reduce that phosphorus input to the lake. Remember, all of what you're seeing here was once part of the north shore of the actual lake. It wasn't naturally separated the way it is today. A big dike was built around these areas and then these lands were pumped free of water so that they could be farmed. Prior to that, this was a natural marsh that filtered the lake. But when we didn't have that marsh anymore, then this phosphorus um, that was on these farm fields was just lost. You know, as oxidization happens, you know, there's a lot of loss of soil here. I think it was about a foot per decade. And all of that eventually, all the phosphorus that was reduced from, uh, lost from that was pumped into the lake as they were drying off these fields. So by stopping that process, just, just that input of phosphorus it really started turning that lake around. So that was the first start to it. And then of course, as it became wet again and the marshes regrew, it just retains more phosphorus naturally. All right, so how is that diet working? So on this graph, you see the annual phosphorus loading from all sources to Lake Apopka. And this color here indicates the farms, now restoration areas. Um, and you can see that in the beginning, that was the majority of the load of phosphorus to the lake, but that has steadily declined. And in the last decade, it has stayed below this blue line which is the total maximum daily load of total phosphorus. So that is the target is to stay below that line. And we are now staying below that. And so um, a consequence of that is that our total phosphorus concentration in the lake is decreasing. So here it was to start with, it has gone up and down a bit, but overall the trend is down. Generally these peaks, these three peaks you see here were the result of droughts. So when we have a drought and we have less water in the lake, then the concentration overall of, of phosphorus, well, of anything really in the lake is gonna be higher because you have the same level of phosphorus, but less water. So your concentration overall gets higher. But you can see that uh, trend is in a favorable direction and that's what we like to see. So it's working. So on this graphic, we can see how the various restoration techniques are coming together to help the lake. We see the farm buyouts, we see the marsh flowway coming online, the farm best management practices 
kicking in, the wetland restorations, the stormwater rule, and that shad harvesting, all continuing through time and how they kind of layer on top of each other to help reach the targets. So while we've met our phosphorus loading targets for most years in the past decade, we've not yet met our in-lake water quality targets of concentration. And this is very common due to legacy amounts of phosphorus that are remaining in the lake sediments. But nonetheless, we are seeing that the improvements are causing less algae growth, which means that there's more light reaching the lake's bottom, which is critical to the submerged plants that colonize, uh, that provide, let's try that again, <laughs> which is critical for submerged plants um, to have the conditions to colonize and grow. And we'll see um, some more examples of that here in just a minute. Okay, so on this picture, you've got a graphic on the left here that shows how the reduction of phosphorus reduces that algae abundance, right? And that lets more light into the lake, which produces more plants, which eventually leads to more fish. So that is the progress we want to see. And we saw this begin to happen as early as 1995. So the sad part about this picture on the right is you can see that pea green color that the lake was at that time. But here you see two little clear areas, and these are eelgred beds. So this is about two years after the farm started some of their best management practices to try to retain more water on the North Shore versus pumping it into the lake. So even back then, started seeing some plant life come back. This was a retention pond that they had built to um, to capture some of that water coming off these farms instead of pumping directly into the lake. So we've just kind of been improving upon that since then, but you could see even little efforts back then, the lake was trying to come back. Now we see far more plants out there. Uh, at one point, we were mapping every time we found a little bit of submerged aquatic plants out here. Um, and then it got to the point that we can't map it all because there's so much of it, which is a great thing. Uh, one of the things that had been happening was that there's a contract to um, reintroduce Illinois pondweed. So that's what you see on this picture. It had been historically very abundant in the lake, but had disappeared almost completely. So the reintroduction of that started in 2018, and now we have over 45,000 such plants in the lake. Here we see some eelgrass. So again, water quality is improving. And as it does, more light gets down there, more plants come on board, and then those plants take up more phosphorus, which leads to clearer water. And so it's this con uh, positive feedback loop. So this is what we want. These um, submerged aquatic plants are a health indicator. They help stabilize the sediments, which reduces turbidity. Um, and of course, it's providing some of that critical habitat to fish within the lake. The benefit of the restoration projects goes beyond just the lake itself. We're seeing a great amount of wildlife diversity across the North Shore as well. It's a very diverse place. In addition to the extensive marsh systems, there are pine uplands, there are scrubby flatwoods and sand hills. So it leads to a very diverse flora and fauna. So in addition to the large alligators that Lake Apopka is so known for, and for the large mammals that we just saw a bunch of pictures of, right? All the photo bombers, the bears, the coyotes, the bobcats, otters, and the hogs. Um, there's also a great variety of other species. And of course, the one that Apopka is known most for is its bird abundance. So there have been 369 bird species recorded on site, which is super impressive by all standards and measurements. Um, this has in turn led to a lot of bird-based recreation, festivals, tours, all that kind of stuff. So now we now have a dedicated North Shore Birding Festival put on by the Orange Audubon Society every year. And that brings in hundreds of visitors from all over. Um, and shortly after that, we followed up with the Space Coast Birding and Wildlife Festival, and that brings hundreds of people as well. So you might say we're not on the Space Coast. Well, we're not. We're, we're about an hour and a half or so from the Space Coast. But because of the bird abundance, they just can't pass up coming here as well. So got two big birding festivals going on here. Um, we also have extensive dragonfly and uh, butterfly species lists and lots of other species lists because it really is a very diverse property overall. 
And that wildlife diversity is what drives recreation at Lake Apopka North Shore. So let's talk a little bit about that recreation, what it looks like. So of course, birding. Birding is, is the big thing out here, but cycling is also a major recreation out here. And um, the wildlife drive has become very popular because here's an opportunity for folks to kind of get deep into the wilderness without having to hike in the Florida heat and uh, get the bug bites and all that kind of stuff. And let's face it, not everybody's even capable of doing that, even if you wanted to, you know, there might be elderly or you may have a lot, of, you may have young kids or some sort of disability. So it just, it opens it up for anybody with a vehicle. So anyone can drive the wildlife drive. So that has become hugely popular. Now within um, the recreation category, we do have a trailhead closure right now, Magnolia Park, which is run by Orange County Parks and Recreation is closed because they're doing a bunch of construction to make that even better. So in the meanwhile, we created a temporary parking area for folks that were using that trailhead off of Lust Road to accommodate those users. So um, the city of Apopka has been generous enough to let us use that piece of land for some temporary parking. I, I had to, I couldn't pass up talking about recreation without showing pictures of these cyclists here who are very enthusiastic about our pump house to the point that they actually had jerseys made with their pictures, uh, with the picture of the pump house on them. So really, really neat. I had to share that. Um, okay, so Magnolia Park, here's a picture of some of their construction, some of what they're building and stuff. And so Again, the cyclists and hikers that we're using that can use any of our remaining trailheads as well as that temporary parking uh, spot. So this is the part that's under construction that cannot be used right now. And these are the trailheads that we still have. And then this is the temporary one off of Lust Road. So feel free to come in on any of those areas. And it's just a picture of that temporary parking area um, and how you get in to the property. And you can see if you drive through those yellow gates there, um, that in here, so it's right here that the parking is. And it tends to get pretty full as you can see by that picture up there. Here's a look at our recreation numbers. So this is uh, loop trail visitors from our four trailheads. So this is not counting all the people that are coming in from Lust Road. And we know that that is uh, thousands of people, no doubt. Um, but we don't have an accurate counter there that can separate them from motor vehicles and that kind of stuff. So this is what we know we have as far as non-motorized visitors. This is through November. So over 14,000 people coming in from these various trailheads, um, primarily using the loop trail. Now taking a look at the wildlife drive visitors. So these are the people coming in via car, uh, Friday, Saturday, Sundays, and holidays. To date, for 2021, we have 156,000 visitors coming in that way. Now, that is through November, so this graph will bump up a little bit um, for our total 2021 count once the December numbers are in. But if you look at our combined data from our trailheads and the wildlife drive, we have a minimum of 170,000 people visiting Lake Apopka North Shore this year. And that's just through November, and it does not include any of those cyclists or hikers that are coming in on Lust Road during Monday through Thursday, since we do not have a functional counter there just for cyclists and pedestrians. So it's, it's a lot of usage. I would not be surprised if we hit the 200,000 um, visitor mark by the end of December. To insist are all those users, we have this wonderful ambassador program. This is administrated entirely by the Orange Audubon Society and it's run by volunteers and they help educate the visitors at the Lake Apopka North Shore. They greet them and get them oriented. They promote outdoor ethics and they educate the visitors about the restoration, the plants and the animals out here on site. So it's fully staffed and organized by Orange Audubon Society, as I mentioned, and they have volunteers out there every Saturday and Sunday, which are our busiest times. And they also assure that everybody gets off the property safely by five o'clock. And they have contributed thousands of volunteer hours, thousands of volunteers hours. So big thank you to Orange Audubon for that and all their wonderful ambassadors. Keep it up, guys. Let's talk a little bit about the ecological restoration that's going on on the North Shore. We've talked about the lake quite a bit. Um, so within our uplands there, so primarily sandhills, uh, we've planted another 46,400 plants. Um, you can see sort of the mix of what those were here. 
And then within the marshes, we've done 6,000, almost 200 plants. That's mainly Spartina and cypress trees. So this is where the um, sand cordgrass, the Spartina, was recently planted. So these are the plants that came in, nice healthy looking tubelings, one in the ground, and it basically just looks like a field of little spaghetti straws uh, sticking out there. But give it some time, so it'll be nice and bushy and look great. Here's uh, cypress trees coming in, uh, one gallon pots on these ones. And there's a planting crew out there putting them in the ground. We put some shade cloth uh, uh, along these to keep the weeds from getting in there because it's hard to mow and weed whack between all these trees and we didn't want the trees taken over by vines and other things. So then we covered that with mulch and watered them in. And we had uh, staff out there having some uh, planting time in some of the harder to get to areas that we didn't want to put uh, our contractors through. And then we also got a few larger trees that we put in some areas. Uh, these larger trees are far more expensive so we did uh, less of those. All the smaller trees were donated to us by Cherry Lake Tree Farm. So we got those for free, just had to um, provide the labor. So that was a wonderful benefit. So shout out to Cherry Lake and thank you for that. Um, as far as the rest of the upland restoration that we talked about, it's mainly over on our west side of the property over here. And we've had a lot of help from the Native Plant Society throughout the years. Um, not only with planting plants, um, we've had contractors do it as well, but we've had lots of volunteers out there planting. But they also come back every year and they help survey and see what's surviving, what's doing well out there. So they're just super enthusiastic. They come out and mark all the good plants. Um, this is a polygula litonia that was being marked. Um, and here's some of our new or latest phase. This is the phase five planting in what we call the Castle Hill area. You can see how that's coming along nicely. This is some pictures from phase four. So they're real tiny when they go in the ground, but they, they perk up, get big pretty quick. So this is really neat. So this is some wire grass. You can see how small and uh, scattered they seem when they first went in. And now look at them, just taking off, just looking wonderful out there. And this is also from the phase two area. Everything's just looking so nice. This is um, toad flax and blue curls. All right, let's talk about some less happy plants or, or plants that we're less happy to have out here. So invas invasive plant control, of course, is huge out here. We have all sorts of um, not so great things out here. So this is just a list of some of the things we fight out on the property. So this year have treated 1,062 acres of not so great stuff. And uh, this is our invasive plant crew hard at work. Sometimes they have to take to the air. Um, sometimes they use some mechanical means to get these. So this is the we do, working on clearance of vegetation without chemicals, which is always nice. So that's all I got, folks, and um, we'll take any questions you might have if we have any time. Excellent. Thank you, Marie. And uh, from here, we'll be sharing Graham Williams. I apologize for audio issues earlier. And then now we'll go to South Central. Here's Graham. Hi, my name is Graham Williams. I'm the district's South Central Region Land Manager. The South Central Region encompasses 10 different conservation areas, totaling a little more than 80,000 acres in Orange, Seminole, North Brevard, and South Volusia counties. Within the region this past fiscal year, we conducted 11 prescribed burns on three properties. Uh, that's three more burns than we were able to do last year. And it was a little better than 3,300 acres, uh, which is roughly double what we accomplished last year. So I was pretty happy about that. Um, a lot of the acreage was thanks to three large aerial ignition burns that we conducted on Hal Scott. Um, the areas that were prescribed burned this past year are shown on the map in red. And we also had five wildfires in the region, totaling 227 acres. Um, those were on three different properties, Seminole Ranch, Econ, Sand Hills, and Buck Lake, and those are shown on the map in orange. 
we sh also shared lots of our resources um, helping other folks burn both within the district and also lots of other agencies and uh, we also leaned on them for help um, we, you know some of these larger burns required a lot of resources and we're very grateful to have lots of outside assistance come and help us this year every year I always like to acknowledge all the uh, wonderful support that we get from all of our cooperating agencies and partners um, there's no way we could do the burning that we do without their help and uh, there's just too many folks to thank individually but um, every single year I'm always impressed at how many folks come together to uh, work on the common goal of getting more fire on the ground so thanks to everybody that helped us this past year one of the big highlights of the burn season this year was not only uh, getting a, a large aerial burn done uh, in the growing season at Hal Scott, but doing it on July 15th, which happened to be the same day that two other district properties were also burning. And collectively, the three burns surpassed the prior district burn record for a uh, number of acres burned in one year. So it was pretty cool to get to be a part of that burn that helped break the record and put us over 52,000 acres burned in the district uh, for the fiscal year. So, and again, we had lots of cooperators and partners on the burn helping us out. Um, no way we could have pulled it off without them. So thanks again for all the help. Another big highlight of the burn season this year was accomplishing so much at Hal Scott, um, getting a lot of acreage in in the growing season, including about half of our occupied red cockaded woodpecker habitat. Uh, those are the areas in the dark red um, that was all burned this last year. And that also sets us up really well for two additional big aerial burns to do this year um, to the south and north of, of what we accomplished um, last year. So I was really happy about that. These large aerial burns in woodpecker habitat are a little more complex than some of them uh, might be otherwise, because we have to go in on the ground and, and burn out by hand around all these individual uh, woodpecker cavity trees to protect them from the flame front. So you can see the crew in there with the ATV on the ground, uh, burning out and protecting that tree. Here's another view of the advancing flame front to the left. That's the line that we put in with the helicopter. And then you can see the ground crew uh, upwind of the, the main fire, burning out and protecting around these trees. And so the flames, you know, gradually burn away from those um, woodpecker cavity trees to make sure that they're well protected before the main fire reaches the area. Uh, I was also really happy to get some of these burns in um, in some pretty complex units that are, you know, sandwiched between places like Avalon Park and, and a power plant. Um, there's, you know, Obviously, smoke concerns with trying to burn in areas like this, but we managed to, to get some of them uh, accomplished this year, so I was really pleased with that. Here's a view um, over the top of Wedgefield, looking back toward the west of the last large burn that we did there this past summer. Um, so you can kind of see what it looks like from the air. Uh, accomplishing those types of burns in these interface areas would be really difficult if we didn't have support from the community. And uh, Hal Scott, I'm extremely grateful to have a Firewise group within the community there. Um, they're just so helpful to uh, help us connect with the residents and um, get our message across as to what we're doing and why. And uh, the Wedgefield Firewise um, Facebook page is, is kept up to date and I, you know, I can let them know when we're burning. They get it out to the community and they can tell me exactly how many folks they reached. And uh, it just provides a really good uh, venue for communicating with the community and uh, helping us accomplish our goals. And we're also very fortunate to have another Firewise community in the Great Outdoors, uh, which is adjacent to our Canaveral Marshes Conservation Area. So we're active in that group as well. Um, this past year, unfortunately with COVID, we weren't able to participate in as many events as we typically do, but uh, hopefully in the coming year we'll be back to a little bit closer to normal and uh, doing lots of outreach through the Firewise community. Moving on to some highlights of our ecological management efforts this past year. 
I uh, just wanted to talk about a project we did at Buck Lake where we mowed down approximately 50 acres of overgrown scrub to help enhance habitat for Florida scrub jays. Uh, this started out as a 35-acre project and it went so well and uh, came in under budget that we were able to add an additional 15 acres. Um, so we did about 50 total. Here you can see we started out with really overgrown scrub, just really thick, uh, getting to be a bit too big and, and tall for us to burn it safely and effectively. Um, so we had to go in with a mechanical option and, and mow it down. So there's the equipment that was used, um, basically taking it down almost to ground level uh, with a, a coarse mulch. After the mechanical treatment was completed, we wanted to make sure that we didn't end up just with a thicket of regrowth that you know would not be exactly what we were looking for and still not quite provide the habitat that we needed. So we decided to try something a little bit different. Um, we were called it donuts and donut holes with herbicide. This was a project that our herbicide guru Randy uh, helped me to devise when we treated areas within the mulch mode um, portions of the unit as well as some areas that hadn't been mowed uh, that were also overgrown that we spot treated to help create sandy openings which are utilized by lots of different scrub species including the Florida scrub jay. When it came time to do this herbicide application we were fortunate to have the ability to use some aerial resources uh, since they happen to be nearby treating some Ligodium uh, with the helicopter with this spray rig uh, bucket that hangs down below, we were able to do the work uh, with the ship and uh, do some precision spot treatments um, in the scrub to create the uh, sandy openings that we were looking for. After the areas had been mechanically treated and then also chemically treated, we came in in August and conducted prescribed burns and burned all of the treatment areas um, to clean up all the mulch debris and also applied fire to the, uh, the chemically treated areas that had not been mulched. Upon revisiting the sites this winter, so far it looks like we uh, achieved our results that we were looking for. We've got some nice sandy openings uh, where there's relatively little coming back. Now remember this was almost 100% solid oak thicket uh, before, which, you know, provides some habitat for jays, but they really need these um, openings to cache acorns and also provide, um, you know, a little bit of heterogeneity to the habitat structure. So, so far, it looks like uh, it's working pretty well. It's a little too soon to see uh, whether or not we're going to get exactly what we wanted, but uh, I'm pretty optimistic that uh, this, this might work out well on a larger scale. Um, so this was kind of a pilot project to see how it would go and, and so far I'm pretty pleased with the results. Now we did this work to help bolster our scrub jay population on the site and uh, provide more suitable habitat for jays, but it also provides habitat benefit to lots of other species in the scrub, everything from gopher tortoises and gopher frogs and uh, a whole suite of other plants and animals. We have another project in the works at Canaveral Marshes where we're planning to treat about three to four hundred acres of um, marsh habitat that's become encroached with woody vegetation. Um, this is things in particular like Brazilian pepper, salt bush, wax myrtle, uh, but also young cabbage palms that are encroaching into the marsh and taking over. Um, and we're doing this in conjunction with our partners at FWC and also the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, primarily to help create additional habitat for the eastern black rail, uh, which has recently been uplisted as uh, threatened status. And so this coming fiscal year, we plan to do the larger treatment, but last fiscal year we did a test plot kind of to the uh, northwest of the main treatment area. We treated about 30 acres in there to kind of fine-tune our herbicide mix and application methods. And you can see uh, that little square that sticks off to the uh, northwest of the imagery there. Um, it used to be that dark green, which is all the woody encroachment, and now it's a nice um, kind of pale tan color, and that's all the uh, sand cord grass um, that we left behind. So 
it, it looks like we're going to have some pretty good results. I'm um, kind of trying to achieve what we're going for, um, and I'm excited about that. We also secured funding uh, to have FWC provide um, pre- and post-treatment monitoring for black rails so that we'll be able to determine whether or not our treatments successfully um, created habitat that rails will want to occupy. So the uh, first season of monitoring occurred last year. Um, we did have birds located on the property, but not within the treatment unit. So it'll be interesting to see post-treatment if, uh, if the birds recruit naturally into the area. I'm hoping they will. This past fiscal year, we were uh, shorthanded in the South Central region for about eight of the, of the uh, 12 months. Um, due to some maternity leave and also uh, some medical leave. Uh, so a lot of the work that we normally would do in-house, um, you know, we just didn't have the staffing to be able to keep up with, and one of which was uh, the fire line disking. So we went ahead and, and uh, contracted out our disking work this last year. Um, we put it out to bid. It was about 120 miles of fire line um, spread across five properties. And that actually worked out really well for us. Uh, we were able to get all that line work done and uh, all the lines prepped and not miss any burn opportunities because of uh, line prep needs. Since all of our fire line disking work was contracted out last year, uh, we were able to focus on doing some line improvement work, uh, widening fire lines where needed and grubbing back the vegetation along the edges. Um, kind of building upon a lot of work that we did the, the year before as well. Um, a lot of this was done in-house, some of it was done with contractors, and some of it was done by uh, lessees um, doing work for us on property uh, where they had cattle leases. We also utilized contractors to help us uh, deal with some hazardous trees along fire lines, um, in particular along perimeter fire lines that were near uh, structures or power lines or you know other situations where it could be dangerous to try to uh, work underneath these trees and especially to try to get them down by ourselves so we used the licensed and insured uh, tree service to take care of them for us um, they did this work on several of our properties we also spent a lot of time on the marsh master this year uh, working on fire lines you know both maintaining them and also improving them widening some of them uh, we had appropriate water levels this year to get a lot of that work done. Uh, sometimes it's either too dry to, to work effectively or too wet um, to be able to do the mowing work, but we had a, a long period of time this year kind of in that sweet spot with the water levels right where we needed to be, so we got a lot of our Marsh Master work done this year. Once again this year, I renewed a uh, purchase order with a, a local vendor that helps us out with solid waste cleanup um, to kind of continue building upon the work we've done the past couple of years, um, removing derelict vessels and that you know are dumped at some of our parking areas and other use areas and um, other spots along the river, as well as helping us you know with some of the other uh, large debris and, and refuse that people dispose of that's difficult for us to be able to get rid of things like tires and hazardous waste and stuff like that. Um, I've got a vendor now that cleans it up for us and helps us um, properly dispose of those things. So we did a lot of work this year, um, cleaning up a lot of large debris like that from some of our use areas. This last year, we were also able to continue uh, our relationship with the staff at FPAN, the Florida Public Archaeology Network. Um, to come out and assist us with some archaeological monitoring work at some more ranch and Canaveral marshes. Um, we also uh, are working closely with them to get some guidance on dealing with some serious erosion problems that uh, are impacting some of our cultural sites, um, in particular the Possum Bluff site on Canaveral Marsh. So working closely with them uh, for guidance as well as through DHR on how to handle that situation. This year we conducted J-Watch surveys at Lake Monroe and Buck Lake, um, as we typically do every summer. Only this year uh, the surveys were shortened from three days to two days and uh, done um, with staff only due to COVID. So a little bit reduced um, amount of survey effort, uh, but we still were able to find um, 10 birds at Lake Monroe, which is down one from last year, but still three family groups. Uh, we have one juvenile there this year, so still at least some successful reproduction happening, so we were pleased to see that. 
Um, unfortunately, at Buck Lake, we only detected one bird this year, um, which is obviously less than we'd hoped to have, but we still had at least the one bird there. Um, other sad news in uh, the scrub jay world this year, we lost one of our most dedicated volunteers, uh, Shirley Riley, passed away this year. She had been uh, really, really active helping us out with monitoring jays and um, conditioning them for trapping and banding. So we definitely miss Shirley. Um, she's just a wonderful person, was, was very helpful. So unfortunately, um, she passed away. Shirley was always very helpful at uh, conditioning the birds and getting them used to um, dummy traps so that we'd be able to get them to go into the traps on actual banding day. Um, so unfortunately, without her help this year, uh, our banding efforts were a little bit less than what we would have liked to be. Um, but despite that, we still have most of the birds at Lake Monroe banded. Um, there's a few individuals yet to catch, so we're kind of working on that as time permits. Um, it takes a lot of time and energy to get the birds accustomed to traps and ready for uh, banding, and that's where Shirley would have helped us out a lot. So hopefully we'll be able to continue those efforts and uh, get the remaining individuals banded this coming up uh, year. We had a very busy season at Hal Scott this year with red cockaded woodpeckers. Uh, it's always very busy, but it seemed like this year we, we had even more going on. Uh, we did a lot of work replacing uh, cavity inserts, some of them that had been uh, damaged or, or you know just otherwise wore out um, and also installing several new inserts to help provide additional cavity trees for our birds. Uh, we had a very busy nesting season. I'll have more on that in just a minute. Um, we also helped out with a translocation event uh, to move four pairs of woodpeckers from Osceola National Forest down to St. Sebastian River Preserve. Um, so some staff provided some assistance with that. This is just a look at how we uh, capture birds for translocation. Um, so the, you have to wait for them to go to roost in the evening and then you lift up a net to put over the hole and they fly out and catch them. Um, you drive them to the new home overnight and climb up the tree in the dark and put them into the cavity and uh, pin a little screen over it and come back at sunrise and set them free. Um, we've done this multiple times at Hal Scott and uh, we've always relied on St. Sebastian to provide some assistance because it, it takes a lot of people and coordination to pull something like this off, um, especially with, you know, multiple pairs of birds. And so um, we didn't get any birds at Hal Scott this year, but, uh, but we were able to reciprocate the uh, assistance and help them get some additional birds down to St. Sebastian. As far as Hal Scott goes, our red cockaded woodpecker population is doing very well. Um, we had 12 active clusters again, uh, clusters being, you know, a family group, um, and uh, it's been holding steady at that number since about 2018. You know, obviously we'd like to see that number get bigger every year, but I, I think what's what we're seeing is we've reached a carrying capacity um, where the property is supporting about as many birds as it's able to um, with the acreage we have and the number of mature trees that we have. So. I'm happy that it's at least holding steady, um, you know, at that, that 12 number. So the birds are doing quite well. One of the other uh, measures of success that we look at is the number of potential breeding groups. So just because we have a family group of birds doesn't necessarily mean that they're contributing to the population. So potential breeding group being at least one, you know, adult pair. Um, and that again is holding steady at that 10 numbers. So we've got 10 potential breeding groups on the property again this year. Um, and, you know, as I said, I, I think that's going to be our carrying capacity for a while until we get some more, um, you know, large mature trees for these birds to move into. This is a chart of our, our population history going all the way back to 2004. Um, you can see the highlights at the bottom there being the 12 active clusters, um, 35 adult birds, which is down just a, a few from what we had last year. Um, but despite that, still really good reproductive output. We had 15 fledglings this year, which ties the record for the most we've ever had. Um, you know, average group size is, is pretty high at 3.5, um, and fledglings per group at 1.5 is pretty good for uh, for the species. So. Really pleased with the reproductive output. Uh, the birds seem to be responding really well to all the burning that happened there over the past couple of years. 
Um, so it's, it's rewarding to, uh, to see the birds respond so well. Just wanted to highlight a few partner projects that uh, happened in the region this year. Um, on Lake Jessup, we've had some ongoing work uh, in conjunction with Seminole County to manage the Phragmites along the lakeshore. Uh, so building upon past um, projects, we did an additional uh, roughly 200 acres of treatment on the North Shore and the East Shore, knocking back uh, the Phragmites from the, uh, the edge of the lake. Um, we also included about 60 acres of cattail um, that's an outfall from a, a stormwater facility um, to uh, help control that. So this was all work that was done by the county's contractor um, under an agreement with the district. Another partnership project in the works, uh, this one is uh, at the Little Big Econ State Forest. I've been working closely with our, our cooperators at FWC, um, as well as U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and the Florida Forest Service on a project aiming to restore the Econ River um, in a, this particular area where there's been a lot of uh, erosion along the stream bank that's resulted in this real shallow, um, expansive sandbar. And so the project is, is going to be uh, removing that sediment from the river bottom and, and uh, restoring the stream bank and uh, replanting with native vegetation and, and stabilizing the area. Um, and this is all being done to help um, with a focus on uh, American shad um, and ensuring that there's sufficient water depth th through this stretch of the Econ River for the shad to be able to migrate upstream to spawn. We've also continued working on uh, various road improvements, parking lot improvements throughout the region. Um, we didn't have the opportunity to do quite as much of that work this past year as, as what we've done um, over the previous few years, but uh, continue to build upon that work, um, you know, pulling in material where we could and uh, relying on cooperators to provide some equipment to help us and uh, trying to maintain these areas both for uh, district access purposes as well as um, improving public use opportunities. We also made some improvements to our Geneva Field Station uh, where the region is based. This past fiscal year uh, our, our compound was badly in need of uh, resurfacing so we got some shell material brought in and uh, some of our operation staff came out with some equipment helped us to uh, tidy up the uh, surface at our Geneva Field Station. Other construction projects in the region this year included the installation of five new uh, low water crossings. Uh, we did three of these at Buck Lake and two at Lake Monroe, um, utilizing a total of 16 of these articulated concrete block mats. Um, it's a good way to provide you know, permanent stabilized access across some of these um, little drainages and, and also uh, has a material you know, that's not going to erode or wash out in big storm events. Um, it works, works out really well, so I've been very happy with it. Um, some of these roads at Buck Lake are also open to public hunts, so we have to make sure that um, the public can easily get through some of these, these uh, wetland crossings while we still allow for you know, natural flow of water and uh, all that sort of thing. So I was happy to get this project done um, and dramatically improve some of these areas and provide better access for fire control and, and land management purposes as well. Those of you who attended this meeting last year may remember uh, we started building a wall around Hal Scott, um, installing over 100 of these concrete jersey barriers in all of our problem spots uh, where we'd had just nonstop um, issues with illegal entry, uh, vehicular access in particular, um, ATVs, side-by-sides, trucks, you name it. Uh, so we did a lot of work last year to uh, kind of Put a stop to it. Um, we had found, you know, this. We found it. It worked really well, but it did also showed us where our remaining uh, weak spots were. So this past year, we uh, put in an additional um, five barriers uh, with the assistance of Ranger Drainage, who helped us with some equipment to move them into place um, to try to really cut back on that. And it, it seems to have worked really well. Um, you know, it hasn't completely eliminated the issue, but it's definitely concentrated into places where law enforcement is a lot more likely to encounter them and be able to help us out with enforcement. We did a lot of work this year improving some of our recreational structures, um, replacing 
wood in, in places where needed on some of our shelters and pavilions and things like that. Um, we also had a region-wide pressure washing contract, so we had a, a contractor go out and, and pressure wash all of our towers and um, all of our, our use facilities and tidy things up really nice for us. Um, our airboat launch down at Highway 50 on Seminole Ranch, uh, we replaced all the decking on that, uh, almost all the decking, the last little bit of it. Uh, the water came up before we were quite able to finish it, so we're going to be finishing that up this year. Um, but uh, it's already getting a lot of use. I'm happy about that. We also had a couple of Eagle Scout projects in the area that helped us out, um, improving some of the uh, infrastructure at our campsites and also repairing some board fencing um, around some of our parking areas. So I'm just happy to have the help with those things. With the high water that we had last fall, uh, provided a good opportunity for us to get out and uh, brush up a lot of our boundary postings and conservation line postings. Um, so Tom and I spent a lot of time on the airboat, um, out remarking all these areas along the river, trying to make sure that uh, enforcement is possible um, and also that hunters know where they're able to hunt and where they're not. And uh, got a lot of good feedback on that. Um, from our user groups that were happy to have you know clearly marked uh, limits as to where they could go and where they couldn't. We also had a whole slew of other things to keep us busy all throughout the year like like usual um, you know lots of dumping and trespassing issues, locks, lock cuts, fence cuts, you know damage to uh, fences and signage and um, illegal campsites and all you know you name it uh, the usual stuff. Keeps us on our toes, so spend a lot of time um, dealing with all these issues. But uh, the addition of our uh, solid waste contract has really helped us out a lot. Um, you know, the, the items that we can't easily fit into our dumpster, I can now call somebody to haul off for me. Um, and uh, we work real closely with law enforcement. Um, our plantation security contract is still in place, so we're able to have officers help us focus on specific issues on, on properties when they arise. Um, so we try to stay on top of these things, but uh, it always keeps us busy. Within the South Central region, we have a dozen different cattle leases. Uh, so I spent a lot of time working with the lessees, um, coordinating on efforts. And uh, the lessees do a lot of work for us, um, things like mowing, um, chopping, fire line disking, various road work, trimming trails, invasive species control, all sorts of things. So they... There's a lot of projects that they're able to help us with. I'm really grateful to have the, the working relationships with the cattle lessees. Um, it provides not only a revenue uh, benefit to the district, but also a lot of additional uh, labor and work efforts on the properties under our management. Uh, we've also got a handful of apiary leases within the region. Um, this past year, we rebid uh, all of the, the apiary sites in the region, um, those being on Lake Jessup, Hal Scott, Seminole Ranch, and Buck Lake. I just want to highlight a few other agreements that uh, we have in the region. Um, one of them being the, our, with our wonderful Eagle Watch volunteers, uh, Bob and Kathy Lale, um, and their little grandson. They've spent a, a lot of time out uh, monitoring our eagles nests on our properties for us and uh, keeping us updated on the, all the latest um, status reports. And um, so that you know, as we're planning our management activities and our prescribed burn schedules and all that thing, all those sort of th things through the year. Uh, we have a really good handle on what the eagles are doing and uh, whether or not their nests are active and if they've fledged yet and all that kind of stuff. So I'm really thankful for all the help um, with that from Bob and Kathy. We're also very fortunate to have another uh, really dedicated volunteer named Danny Bales. He spends a, just countless hours out at Hal Scott helping us monitor our red cockaded woodpecker population. Um, he goes around with the big camera and gets great photos of, of all the birds and uh, it makes it real easy to read their color bands so we know exactly which individuals are out there and where they're living and which trees they're in and um, it's really helpful and, and saves us a lot of staff time um, and also we still occasionally get some former employees uh, coming out and helping us with banding activities when we get a little shorthanded and we just need some extra help so always really grateful for all the support uh, with the woodpecker monitoring it takes a lot of time and effort um, to do that that work, um, but we, we never have a shortage of people willing to help out. So I really appreciate all that.
Typically, we host a handful of adventure races on uh, our properties throughout the year, but with COVID last year, uh, we only managed to host one at Palm Bluff. And then also because of COVID, unfortunately, we did not host any uh, Wounded Warrior hunts on Seminole Ranch this past year. We still have the agreement in place. Um, I'm optimistic that hopefully 2022 we'll be able to, to have an event again, um, but unfortunately none happened last year. I am really excited about this one. Uh, we had a, a site on Seminole Ranch that had been utilized for years by the Outward Bound School um, and due to some changes in their program and uh, cutbacks with COVID and whatnot, they, they pulled their whole operations out of Florida. Um, so that left us with a, a site uh, that you know was appropriate for doing outdoor programming, but nobody to use it and uh, just happened to bump into uh, the local 4-H coordinator and uh, got to talk in and, and uh, came to an agreement to allow the IFAS Extension 4-H program to be able to utilize this site uh, to continue to do, um, you know, outdoor programs uh, geared at, at getting children outdoors and uh, introducing them to, to nature and all sorts of other uh, outdoor activities. So I'm really excited to have that opportunity to make good use of the site and then continue to get youth out into the woods. I know I've already touched on this quite a bit already, but I uh, always just like to extend a, a, my gratitude to all the various agencies and cooperators that help us out throughout the year with a whole slew of different types of projects, everything from prescribed fire to road work, you know, the red cockaded woodpecker work, various specific projects, um, you name it. You know, they're, they're, we're very small staff for what we do and what we manage, and there's no way we'd ever be able to accomplish everything we do without the generous support of, of lots and lots of different people. So um, I know most of you attending this meeting today probably helped me out in one way or another through the year, and I, I really appreciate all that. Our outreach opportunities were somewhat limited last year uh, with all the COVID restrictions, but uh, despite that, we were still able to hold, host a uh, Space Coast Burning Festival trip at Seminole Ranch um, and also a uh, UCF Ecology course um, field trip out to Econ Sandhills. Um, I also participated in a, a career day presentation for um, some water management district folks. And uh, as I mentioned, we are involved in the Firewise groups, um, attending their monthly meetings as they occur, and also uh, um, various events and things throughout the year. Um, so we provide some outreach opportunities to the local communities in that way. And thank you for your time and attention, and we'll have a question and answer opportunity coming up shortly. Excellent, well, thank you, Graham. And uh, from here, we will go to RH's video. If you have any uh, Graham, questions for Graham, please type them in the, in the question box and we'll uh, get to them at the end of the program. My name is R.H. Davis, the land manager of the North Central Region. And I'll be giving you an update on the accomplishments and the activities around the region. The North Central Region covers portions of Marion, Lake, Putnam, Flagler, and Volusia counties. The properties that make up the region consist of Clark Bay, Crescent Lake, Emerald Marsh, Hart Island, Hull Swamp, Lake George, Lake Norris, Ocklawaha Prairie, and Sunnyman. Over the course of the past year, we assisted other regions within the district with 22 burns. Uh, we conducted fall and spring fire line maintenance on over 100 miles of fire line, updated and drafted burn prescriptions for all of our priority burns for the year, and completed 3,107 acres within the region over the course of 20 burn days. Past year proved to be a difficult weather year and we did not meet the burn goals within the region because of an early onset of dry conditions. As for now, the weather trend for this year appears to be much the same as last year and we're skeptical that we'll be able to meet our burn goals again. 
Um, we are looking at using mechanical treatments as budgets allow us to as surrogates for prescribed fire and to prep high fuel load units for reentry. This past September, uh, the district assumed fee title of an addition to the Sunny Hill Restoration Area. The property is located west of the Sunny Hill North Track and was the former con conservation easement, which was a life estate property with a 20 year term. And that 20 year term came due a little over a year ago. The property is primarily flatwoods, scrub and scrubby flatwoods, natural communities. And the site was in somewhat of a state of disrepair. Uh, the roads had not been maintained in, in several years and were quite overgrown. And we've been working to get those roads cleared and opened up where we have access to the property. And we're currently completing that and working on establishing perimeter and interior fire breaks. Uh, we're also working to scout and design the trail system and the access point and with an anticipation of possibly having it open to the public in late summer of 2022. Over the course of the last 12 months, we have completed a total of 3,296 acres of herbicide treatments across the region. 3,284 acres of this were within the old muck farm properties of Emerald and Marsh, Sunny Hill, and Ocklawaha Prairie, and were focused on Cuban bulrush, floating plants, and tussock control, all of which hinder the restoration and maintenance within these old muck farms and block water control structures and create navigational hazards, limiting recreational opportunities. Um, across the region as a whole, um, focused on non-native trees, there was about 83 acres, 175 acres of Kogan grass, 52 acres of Natal grass, 59 acres of coral ardesia. Uh, we also treated 76 acres of Japanese climbing fern and 907 acres of tropical soda apple treatment. Uh, we also did around 133 acres of hardwood control. Those are, that was all part of uh, sand hill restoration projects, uh, primarily up around Ocklawaha Prairie. And then we also do maintenance around uh, our facilities uh, within the region. And so that was primarily grounds maintenance, fence lines, and also uh, treating the toes of the Army Corps levy at Sunny Hill. Continuing our discussion of the ecological management activities uh, within the region, uh, mechanical treatments over, over the course of the last several months, we've completed 79 acres of roller chopping at Clark Bay, 100 acres at Emerald Marsh, uh, this was in area six or the bull hammock area and some restoration areas that we have in there that we were doing some shrub control work on 61 acres at Hart Island, which consisted primarily of chopping out old thin rows to increase access for timber market. Uh, 20 acres at Lake George. This was all within a wildlife opening project. Uh, that we've been working on over the past year, year and a half to establish some openings within the flatwoods at Lake George to create some vegetative diversity and some increased edge for, for feeding areas for wildlife. Uh, 71 acres at Ocklawaha Prairie. A lot of this was done uh, for uh, maintenance and, and continuing of sand hill restoration uh, to kind of control and manage hardwood growth within those areas. Uh, 90 acres of chopping was also done at Sunny Hill, and this was maintenance of some former fuel wood areas uh, where we've been trying to reduce the volume of hardwoods in some overgrown flatwoods areas that hadn't had fire in them for a long time. Uh, mulch mowing. Uh, 20 acres was completed 
over at Clark Bay. This was part of a Florida Forest Service mitigation project around an urban interface area on the southwest side of the property. Uh, we did 65 acres of mulching. This was a fuels management project on the east side of Area 7 at Emerolda. And then we did about 20 acres of mulching up at Ottawa Prairie. The District and the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission Aquatic Habitat Restoration and Enhancement Section have been working over the past several years on cooperative projects throughout the Emerald Marsh. Over the past year, these projects consisted primarily of 21 acres of vegetation shredding that occurred in areas 2, 3, and 4 and the Yale Canal, primarily focused on mobile floating tussle and any floating mats that created a navigational hazard. As for now, there are no specific shredding projects in the future, and they will only be conducted on an as-needed basis to continue to deal with large floating mats that break free and create navigational obstructions. Over the course of the next few years, projects that have been proposed would be to, to add additional breaches between Nemerelda Marsh Area 3 and Lake Griffin and the south side of Area 3 and Haynes Creek. The FWC has also proposed a project that will be comprised of some mechanical vegetation harvesting about five acres in size in an old oxbow channel off of Haynes Creek along the southern side of Area 3. This vegetation will be harvested and then trucked through internal roads within, within Area 3 to a spoil site up more in the northeast corner of Area 3 along either side of the airstrip levee, which is the access to the boat ramp. Forest management projects that have occurred or are planned to occur throughout the region consisted of a 280 acre in-house timber marking project at Hart Island, tree planting projects that were conducted at Lake George totaling about 70 acres and Hull Swamp totaling about 91 acres. We currently have active timber sales on several properties. That would be at Clark Bay, the Jolly Ford sales, 189 acres of first thin. This sale was partially cut and the crews had to pull off due to some wet conditions and we haven't been able to schedule the crew to come back as of today. And the south side timber sale would be 181 acres and that's comprised of a clear cut and the remainder would be first thin. Lake George Conservation Area, we have the Phil Road Sale, which is 159 acres of first thinning, and most of this will be in Longleaf Pine. The Jumping Gully Sale is 223 acres. This is a marked thinning, so it's the second thinning operation. And the Silver Pond Sale, which is in planning right now and contract preparation. The Hart Island Conservation Area, we've got the Strong Road Sale, which is 358 acres of second thinning. 280 acres of this sale was the in-house timber marking project. The Hart Island grade sale is 82 acres and it's the first thin steel road sale, 235 acres. It's the second thin and it's also partially cut and the crews pulled off of that during some really wet conditions and, and haven't been able to come back. Same thing with the bullpen sale is 287 acres of first thin. The whole swamp conservation area, we've got a sale in there, 261 acres of first thinning. It's also a partially cut sale from back in 2016-17 that we're still working to try to get completed. On the construction and maintenance side of things over the past year, we've spent a fair amount of time repairing damaged perimeter fences due to motor vehicle crashes. This, both board fences and parking lots and, and wire fences along our perimeters. Uh, 
completed slope mowing of all the farm levee slopes within Emerald and Marsh, Ocaba, Prairie, and Sunny Hill. In Hart Island, we're continuing repairs to all the internal roads. Um, that's patching holes and reshaping crowning roads and capping where needed. We replaced some failed culverts at Wells Road and State Road 40. Constructed a new fire line along the south boundary of the Strawn Parcel. I said this was due to a uh, boundary contest that we had with a neighbor uh, that we needed to move the boundary line. At Lake George, we completed repairs to Bars Road, Otter Road, Silver Pond Road, Middle Road, and Phil Road. We have plans developed to continue improvements to Truck Trail 2, and we'll be looking to do at least a mile of lime rock capping on that road later this year, early next year. And we demolished and removed the retired security residence. On the Sunny Hill Restoration Area, Repairs to the Levy 212, the Army Corps Levy along the western boundary of the North Track, and all the internal roads continue. In Emerald Marsh, construction within levy construction within Area 5, this is the area that was leased for a peat harvesting operation. That construction has begun with an anticipation of beginning the peat harvesting sometime in the spring of 2022. We also completed repairs to the wildlife drive in preparation of getting it open around the end of February. An interagency cooperation. We have regional staff that serve on the Southern Area Engine Academy Steering Committee. We also assisted the Lake County Sheriff's Office with a missing person search near Paisley. We hosted a S-130, S-190 field day exercise and that was in the area around the Blue House of Sunny Hill in conjunction with the Florida Forest Service, U.S. Forest Service, and Marion County Fire Rescue. We coordinated with the Florida Forest Service to hold Operation Outdoor Freedom event at Octawaha Prairie in Hart Island. We assisted Volusia County land management folks with prescribed burns on the Lake George State Forest. We also assisted Flagler County's land management with prescribed burns, Dunn's Creek State Park, and the University of Central Florida. In wildfire assistance, we have staff within the region that are standing members on the Marion County Wildfire, Wildland Fire Task Force. We also assisted Florida Forest Service with the Murray Road Wildfire in Putnam County and have staff that serves on the Florida Red Type 1 Interagency Incident Management Team, and they also deployed on a federal fire deployment near Medford, Oregon. Recreation activities this past year primarily comprised of performing trail maintenance as needed to assist the trail maintenance contractor. We also replaced a stolen entrance sign at Hart Island at the Strong Track Trailhead. Replaced the entrance sign at Ocklawaha Prairie at the Chernobyl Trailhead. Removed the damaged kiosk from Hart Island that was at the B Road access point. And brought it back to the shop for repair. We constructed and installed new road signs on all the public accessible roads at Lake George and Hart Island. Replaced the fire ring and benches at Lake George, Bars Landing Campsite. Replaced the benches at the Sunny Hill Group Campsite. Worked with the Altoona Trail Riders and installed two new hitching posts that they donated at the Sunny Hill Group Campsite. Repaired a damaged access ramp to the gazebo at Ottawa Prairie. Cleaned up trash in parking areas, campsites, and high use areas as needed. Repaired damaged board fencing in parking areas and access points as needed. And installed harmful algal bloom notice signs at all the public boat ramps within district on district owned lands within the region. Each year always seems to bring its new challenges as well as the standard that you always come to expect. This year trash dumping did not disappoint as we've had to clean up a lot of trash that's dumped around the area 
hauling it out by the trailer load most of the time. We continue to battle illegal access, people cutting chains on gates, cutting fences, and driving in where they're not supposed to. Crooked wood cutting around the Lake George and the Heart Island properties, as well as Palmetto Berry poaching. Illegal hunting is something that just seems to continue. Had a lot of instances of vehicles versus fencing this year, which kept us on our toes repairing fence, and also theft and vandalism, as is shown in the picture here, where someone decided to uh, take one of our wheel loaders for a joy ride, in which they wound up in a canal, and it wound up sunk in the marsh at the Sunny Hill Restoration. And this concludes our update for the past year for the North Central Region. At this time, we can entertain any questions that you may have. Thank you. Excellent. Thanks, RH. Now I'll be introducing the, pardon me for a second. The recreation public rule or recreation rule evaluation for uh, or for the district. We are looking at district camping rules as well as rules governing e-bike usage on district lands. So currently, the camping rules are governed under administrative code. They were last revised about 20 years ago. We have 23 primitive, primitive campsites throughout the district. They are no fee. But these are primitive campsites where there's no potable water, there's no electricity. RVs are, are, cannot get to these sites. Uh, you can reserve these sites 90 days in advance. The current length of stay or parameters allow for seven continuous days of stay and no more than 30, 30 total days per year per conservation area campsite. What the district is evaluating is maintaining the length of stay to no greater than seven continuous days, but capping the, the total days district-wide as opposed to per campsite. We're looking to create a more uh, equitable chance for reservations because we have had times where users have essentially monopolized campsites and then moved to another campsite and done similar, um, similar things. But we would like your comments uh, either uh, on, on any of this, but in particular uh, how we're, these rules are being evaluated. If, if this fits, if you feel like it doesn't, uh, let us know via email at Central Recreation Comments at sjrwmd.com. Or if you have something right now, please drop it in the questions box. We're also looking at uh, of how e-bikes are used or electric bicycles are used on district lands. This has become more and more common. And we are looking to mirror what the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission has already established in their uh, rules. Electric bicycle manufacturers have adopted a class system for the different types of, of, of e-bikes. And that system has been adopted by the Florida State in Florida State statutes. So there's three classes. We're class one. There's a maximum of uh, 20 mile per hour, but the rider must be pedaling for the motor to engage for you to get that electric assist for the motor assist. And then there's class two and three uh, e-bikes, which are often equipped with a throttle, so uh, like a thumb throttle, like an ATV where you don't necessarily have to be pedaling to get that, uh, that motor assist. Uh, the difference between those is essentially maximum mile per hours where two is 20 mile per hour max and three is 28 per hour max. So class three also has to be equipped with a speedometer. 
what we are looking at is allowing class one e-bikes. Those are the ones that have to be pedaled for any type of uh, motor assist to be allowed on trails that are currently designated for bicycle use. The more powerful and throttle operated class two and three e-bikes may, may be operated on what would be the district's equivalent of FWC's named and numbered roads. We envision it to be something like where you can operate a licensed road legal motor vehicle on our district lands, which there are several properties that you are allowed to do that, um, both on and outside of hunting season. Uh, but limiting that operation of those class two and threes to uh, not being off road, not on any trails, multi use trails, and not on fire breaks. Our aim is to minimize any damage that could be occurring from these more powerful uh, e-bikes, as well as minimizing user conflict and any safety concerns. For both these, this e-bike and the camping, nothing has changed. As of now, what stands in our rules is still applicable. It wouldn't be until March when these rules are presented to the legislature that any changes could be occurring. So please let us know if you have any comments. Um, look into the Center for Recreation comments uh, at SARWMD. Send us a, an email comment there. If you have any questions right now, please type it in. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to Pete to our uh, for our uh, uh, general comment session. Let's see. Okay, yeah, you had to unmute me, Chris. Got it now. Thanks, Pete. Okay, you got me? I got you now. Okay, all right, so uh, we're at the public comment question uh, portion of the meeting. So, uh, like Chris said, if anyone has any questions, please add those into the chat because I don't believe that we'll be able to hear you. Um, so any questions put in the chat and uh, all the panelists are here so we can get the um, correct person on to answer the question. So right now we have one uh, concerning the temporary parking at Lust Road. Uh, in any way that could be permanent. Maria, do you have the insight or Pete? Um, I, I think that was really just to, to as a temporary parking for, um, you know, to be there until the Magnolia Park construction is complete. So I don't think the plans are to keep that. Is Maria on? I'm on, Pete, yes. can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, so uh, yeah, right now there has been no firm commitment from the city of Otaka, although there has been some discussion. Long term, they are planning on making that a holding park, um, and then there will be more, more, you know, access and such. But exactly what that will look like, we do not know. Okay, I, I had trouble understanding you, Maria, but mm -hmm. um, it, it did sound like that the city of Apopka doesn't have any um, any plans right now, but long term um, there might be uh, there's going to be an, an possibly an environmental ed center there, and then possibly some parking there. Um, yes, they're, they're planning on making it a burning park, and there has been some discussion as to whether or not they will keep access there, but no uh, firm decision has been made at this time. Right. Okay. So, so the the current site of the temporary parking lot will be developed likely into a birding park. That is the discussion. Yes. Okay. Uh, Beth, did that make sense for you? Um, let's 
see. I'll see if she gets better. Yeah. Can you hear me better now? I think I had the wrong audio selected. Yeah, that's you, much. You better. sound real good. Um, okay. Maria. Sorry about that. Oh, yeah, hopefully everybody got. But yes, there has been discussion of keeping that open, but they haven't come to a firm decision yet. But as soon as we know, we'll let the general public know. We'll post it on our website. Yeah, and, and as Maria mentioned, it's important to note that it is the city of Apopka's property. It's not it's not the district's property. So um, uh, we, we did request of them to, uh, to have that temporary parking on their property until Magnolia Park construction is complete. All right, yeah, we have another one regarding Lake Apopka, um, how we can support hydraulic control on in the lake. I wanted to, it's termed, how, I wanted to know for Lake Apopka, how we can support hydraulic control for the lake. Um, well, F FWC is the agency that's responsible for hydraulic control in the lake. So I think the best way to do that is to uh, coordinate that through the FWC. Um, and we can get you contacts uh, for that as well if, if folks need that. Um, yeah. Randy, you have anything to add to that one? Can you unmute? I'm Randy trying to get there. Yeah. Trying to unmute. I'll chime in while we're waiting, to see if Randy can come online. But it's Natalie Vischer, I believe, with Fish and Wildlife Commission. If somebody wishes to reach out to her. Hello. Uh, yeah, this is Randy. <clears throat> Maria is exactly correct. Yeah, Natalie Vischer runs, is the regional biologist for Lake Apopka, and uh, they have uh, meetings in Lake Apopka where you can voice your opinion. They have uh, lake strategy meetings, and those are always posted online prior. That's really the best way to get your voice heard is to go to the meetings. All right. Excellent. So we have one, one second. We have one about the e-bikes. Um, have you been approached about use of e-bikes by disabled people as a way to increase access? Would this be an exception to the ordinance? I, I think from what I understand, we're still in developing that. Uh, as, as far as any changes that might occur in the rules. Jeremy or Brian, do you have anything? You said to unmute yourself. Yeah, this is Jeremy. The mobility um, assist devices would be would be uh, separate from the e-bikes, so um, that'd be kind of a separate thing. As Brian, um, for for disabled uses, we operate our uh, allowing special access through our special use authorization process, and uh, we follow FWC's. Uh, AMP permit process where you have to get a doctor's uh, note to fill out the AMP uh, permit application, uh, which will get you ac special access if you've drawn a permit on a WMA through FWC's process, but we also use that same procedure to allow access uh, on, on district lands outside of the WMA process through our special use authorization. It's all on our website. We've got another one about the Lust Road parking lot. Um, seeing if, if there is any other options as far as parking uh, Monday through Thursdays uh, for use for walking or biking at the Wildlife Drive without having to start from a more distant trailhead. 
Is there any other thoughts? Or is that? Um, well, the Magnolia Park should be reopening shortly, we hope. Um, they're saying spring, which isn't that far uh, away. But in the meanwhile, your closest parking lot, you can actually park at the Wildlife Drive exit if you wish to walk in from there um, or cycle in from there. And then the next closest one is going to be at the Duda North Shore. But other than that, uh, that parking right there at Lustra will remain open at least until Magnolia Park opens. And the it's Jones Road is where the the exit is, correct? That's correct. Side? Yes, Jones okay. Jones Road. There's a, a sign there. It says Jones Stormwater. So that's look for that sign, and that's that's where the exit is. There's a handful of parking spots there, but there's there's usually plenty of space. Excellent. Thank you. Not seeing any questions yet. Uh, Chris, I have something to add to the person that was asking about uh, hydrilla management on Lake Apopka. Sure. Um, if you go onto the FWC website, um, you can go into uh, a program that they have that's called What's Happening on My Lake. And, and you can view uh, all different types of things, uh, including uh, aquatic plant treatments that are happening on, on certain water bodies. And there is uh, there is a, a way to provide comment via email on that page as well. Uh, for the for the Harris Chain of Lakes, it would be um, it looks like Scott Scott Bisping at my FWC, but but that would be a good um, a good a good website to go to. And I'll I'll see if I could uh, put this um, website in the chat. All right, so so I, I put it in the chat. So okay. that's yeah. uh, well, what's happening on my lake for the Harris chain. I'll throw that in there too. I put that in the the question box as well. The that link that you provided. So, try and get that to you also, Deborah. Email. Give it a couple more minutes. Yeah, Dan. Uh, it's. The, there is no chat box on that. It's only the question box. That was a, uh, I got my, uh, my setups kind of crossed on that. So you're not missing anything besides just this question box that the uh, audience is seeing. So you're you're not missing anything, Dan. If you have any other questions, just drop it in the question box. Oh, we have 35 folks attending originally. Now it's down to 28. So. Let's give it one more minute just to make sure that we, we're not missing anything. I feel pretty good wrapping it up. If there's anybody else, go ahead and, and you can feel free to email, email us at central recreation comments at sjrwmd.com after the meeting is over. It's, it's been real good. 
getting to chat with everybody. I really, really appreciate it. I just want to thank everyone for participating. I can send a big thank you to Christopher Jordan and our IT department for facilitating this. And uh, personally, I'm very proud to be able to have the chance to work with Maria Graham, RHP, and everyone here at the district. who puts a tremendous amount of effort into making Florida and the world a better place. I wish uh, everyone a wonderful holiday season and a prosperous new year. We're going to go and close out the webinar. Thanks, everybody. And um, take care. Thanks, Chris. That's Thank Chris. you, Pete. Yeah.